Mike would come in. Sure, sounds good. Um, uh, thank you everyone for, for uh, joining us. We'll, we'll get started. Uh, this is the second episode of the NTU R Street uh, Pentagon Purse Strings webinar series where uh, Jonathan Bedlack and I um, cover uh, all, all sorts of issues uh, related to and impacting the very large Pentagon budget. Um, uh, again, I'm Andrew Lodz, Policy and Government Affairs Manager at, at National Taxpayers Union. Uh, uh, and with me is Jonathan Bidlack at R Street Institute. Our, um, our special guest today, or our first special guest today, is Brian Riedel. He's a senior fellow at Manhattan Institute focusing on budget tax and economic policy. Previously, he worked for six years as the chief economist to Senator Rob Portman and as a staff director of the Senate Finance Subcommittee on Fiscal Responsibility and Economic Growth. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're on mute, Brian. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Jonathan, for inviting me and for reminding me to unmute. It's amazing after all this time in the pandemic, I think none of us have figured out how mute buttons work. But You know, it could be worse. I could have a cat face, a cat face like that uh, video, the cat lawyer. <laughs> I, 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 I used that on our all staff yesterday, actually. I figured out how to do it. So, and I, and I did Very manage nice. to get rid of it for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, maybe we can kick things off. I don't know, Andrew, if you yeah. have a question, or you want me to start with the start? Um, Go for it. I think I, I thought, you know, maybe uh, the, the word, the, the term that's been in the news lately has been reconciliation. Uh, and so since we're talking about the budget outlook, and we'll obviously talk about the Pentagon budget specifically, uh, maybe it's worth uh, you, Brian, talking to us a little bit about how reconciliation works, explaining to our viewers just sort of what we can kind of expect to see in the next few weeks. And we'll start there. Sure. I mean, I mean re reconciliation is a very powerful um, budget process that was created in 1974. The key thing to think about with reconciliation is you can really typically do it about once a year. A reconciliation bill cannot be filibustered. That's the key point, which means it can pass the Senate with just 50 votes plus the vice president. It's a very powerful process, but it comes with some limitations. First, it's a budget process created to change budget numbers. So all the provisions must be chiefly budgetary rather than regulatory. So it can have a budget cost, but if the budget cost is merely incidental to the non-budget effects, you can't use it. An example we're hearing right now, the $15 minimum wage probably wouldn't work because it's not chiefly a budget reform. A reconciliation bill cannot add to the budget deficit outside the length of the budget resolution, which is like 10 years. It also can't make any changes to social security. So what we're gonna see right now is the Democrats are actually doing last year's budget reconciliation bill because there was no budget last year. So they're actually doing last year's budget now. They're gonna do a reconciliation bill. It's looking like it's gonna be about $1.9 trillion. Like I said, they probably cannot do minimum wage, but they can do a lot else. And the key thing, again, is you can pass it in the Senate with just 50 votes plus the VP. Uh, for sure. And, and it, I think the next couple of weeks are going to be fascinating, uh, uh, as you know, Brian and Jonathan, but as some of our listeners may not know, the House committees are currently marking up all sorts of different reconciliation bills that will then be combined by the House Budget Committee. We expect the Senate to go through a similar process in the coming weeks after the impeachment trial, the second impeachment trial of former President Trump. Um, Brian, it's been widely reported, and you sort of alluded to it here, that, that Democrats actually get a second bite at the apple yeah. this year with reconciliation, because they're currently working on a reconciliation bill for the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2021. They mm -hmm. can still work on a reconciliation bill for fiscal year 2022. Um, do you know, um, uh, do, can you share with our listeners a bit what we know about that effort what, right now, what might be included if Democrats indeed will take a second bite at that apple? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right about getting a second. It's the same thing Republicans did in 2017. There had been no budget passed the year before when Republicans took government in 2017. So they actually were able to do two reconciliation bills. An Obamacare repeal one that failed and the tax cut one that became the 2017 tax cuts. So we're probably, the Democrats can do a second one later in this year. Uh, the options are depending on what happens in the first bill that they're doing right now, they may have to end up doing a second reconciliation bill in summer or fall for another stimulus. Uh, for instance, if unemployment benefits uh, run out in summer uh, or they wanna do yet another round of rebates or another round of PPP subsidies to small businesses, 
they might have, they might do a second re reconciliation bill for a fall version of stimulus. They could do something like infrastructure or climate kind of moving into the regular Biden agenda, but I think it's less likely they would do climate and infrastructure because reconciliation is mostly a tool for taxes and mandatory spending, which is entitlements. And a lot of the climate and infrastructure would probably be on the discretionary side, so it wouldn't work. They, they could also do a reconciliation bill instead for like healthcare expansion. You may remember that that President Biden ran on about one and a half trillion dollars in new health care spending from bringing a public option to the ACA to lowering the Medicare age uh, a couple of years. So we could see health care. We could see more stimulus, but they're probably going to use it for something. So you've sort of um, yeah, I think that's I think that's interesting. Um, you know, I want to obviously tie this a little bit to um, the Pentagon budget and, and defense spending, and I guess you've sort of addressed this, but um, mm -hmm. I guess maybe you could talk a little bit about whether adjustments to defense spending are possible in the in, in this process. And I and I, I asked this question also knowing that you know you've probably heard some of the same commentary that I have, which is that. You know, while it's true that historically, you know, the, the rules that govern reconciliation limit it to just being related to direct spending or uh, mm -hmm. um, or uh, revenue, there are a lot of things that have been proposed, I guess, to get around that. I mean, one is just that it's ultimately the parliamentarian, parliamentarian's opinion, but the presiding officer can theoretically throw that out. They can decide not to abide by the bird rule, for example. Um, and so, you know, do you see that happening? And, and to what degree, you know, is, is there, you know, in, in the defense context, is there potentially some sort of uh, sort of path? There? I think it's unlikely. I mean, historically, reconciliation by design was to change taxes or the baseline for entitlement spending. And appro discretionary spending is usually done on a one year at a time basis in appropriations bills. If the Democrats want, they could try to put discretionary spending into a reconciliation bill. It really hasn't been done before. And it would be interesting to see how the parliamentarian rules on it. I mean, historically, that's just not been the purpose of reconciliation, but they could try. Additionally, you know, you can always just class of, reclassify discretionary spending as mandatory spending. Uh, that would make it uh, let, uh, a, a clear candidate for reconciliation. You still run into certain limitations, though. Like if you're adding spending, you still can't raise long-term deficits, but there, there, there might be creative ways. If Democrats really wanted to do something on defense through reconciliation, there was probably a creative way they could do it. I haven't heard that they want to go in that direction necessarily, but there, there might be ways to get around, get around the rules and the norms. That's fascinating. Um, and, and you know, it, it's, um, it, it may be part of the conversation because I think one, I, I think one thing that I've heard and, and that probably you all have heard um, when it comes to reconciliation, uh, especially the second bite of the apple, is that Democrats may seek some kind of pay fors Now, um, you know, what what we've typically heard in the reporting is that they may try to hike taxes or roll back some of the tax cuts passed by Republicans in 2017, but uh, pay fors likely will be on the table for the second re reconciliation bill. Uh, I do want to remind folks um, that um, we do have a Q&A box um, uh, on this Zoom. We encourage you to ask questions and we'll try to pepper them in throughout. Um, uh, we just received one, Brian, that, um, that, that I want to ask you. So um, a, a listener asks that uh, he says, my understanding is that the COVID bill does include discretionary spending, but it is being marked up by the authorizers, not the appropriators, state and local funding, for example. Is that not true? Is that being reclassified as, as meet mandatory spending to meet the reconciliation rules? That, that it will it'll always be remain to be seen what happens in the Senate. Ultimately, the Senate's going to determine a lot of this. I think that they're they're gonna they're they're probably gonna try to do some discretionary in in here. Uh, it remains to be seen what the parliamentarian is gonna say. I, it's probably allowed, but you know you, sometimes what what you could end up doing is passing two bills side by side as well. You know we did that they did that with Obamacare in two thousand and nine where there was actually a reconciliation bill and then a sidecar bill that passed on the side. So it's it's kind of uncharted territory. I'm 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 curious to see what what the parliamentarian is going to determine on that as well, or if they're going to have them reclassify it as as mandatory somehow, which 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 can be done. You just you can you can write you can write a program as mandatory. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I, that's that's interesting. I think um, 
one of the, th the topics that I think is very relevant to this conversation is we are we are sort of entering into what has been unchartered waters. I mean, mm -hmm. for the last decade or so, right, we've been governed by the Budget Control Act. Um, mm -hmm. And now we're sort of into this new era where um, it's the, the Wild West again, right? I mean, the budget the budget caps are, are expiring. And so um, maybe it would be interesting to talk a little bit about what, you know, what the last decade has looked like, how the Budget Control Act uh, impacted the Pentagon budget. Um, and what you see going forward, I mean, now with the mending, what does that mean for, you know, I guess defense spending specifically, but sort of how we budget, I guess, more broadly speaking as well? Yeah, I mean, let, just to step back for a second, uh, I mean, overall, defense spending's trend has been downward as a percentage of the economy. In the 70s and 80s, uh, defense spending averaged 5.7% of GDP. And after a really big 1990s dip after the Soviet Union collapsed, it was you know, rebounded back up, it was still 4.6% of GDP by 2010. Well, it's 3.2% of GDP now. So the main focus of the BCA, as well as just the winding down of, of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, has been to cut defense spending from 46 to 3.2% of GDP. And it's headed towards about 2.8% in the next decade adjusted for inflation. That 2.8 would be the lowest percent of GDP since the 1930s. So what was the role of the BCA here? The Budget Control Act in 2011 capped defense and non-defense discretionary spending through 2021 on an attempt to, to radically slow the growth. It was supposed to shave $900 billion over nine years off the growth of uh, defense discretionary spending. And when I say off the growth, that's compared to a baseline where it would have grown by inflation. So if you just compared to inflation growth, they were it was supposed to cut $900 billion off that trend line through 2021. It actually ended up cutting about $500 billion off the trend line because the other $400 billion was either repealed in the last couple of years or was replaced by mandatory savings. And so you really, they really only got about half the savings. And a lot of this was in the last couple of years. They just blew through the BCA caps were growing uh, but you know, significantly over it, they just simply set the caps aside. So those are now the basis moving forward are the new inflated levels after we had already blown through the BCA caps. Where we're headed right now, there is no cap, which means every year Congress can just spend what it wants to spend on defense. There is no statutory cap to even get around. We're at $733 billion right now in outlays. I would expect Democrats to want to keep defense spending closer to flat, um, you know, or even some 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 cuts, you know, that we've seen from the progressives who've wanted to cut, you know, 15% off the off the defense budget. More realistically, I would expect growth somewhere between flat and inflation from the $733 billion level right now, which is what will keep it falling as a percentage of the economy. You know, again, closer down to about 2.8% of the economy. To put this in the broad context, we are projected to have defense spending in 2030 pretty much exactly what it was in 2008 adjusted for inflation. You know, that the net effect from 2008 when we were, you know, doing the surge in Iraq to 2030 will be a defense budget that is basically flat adjusted for inflation over a 22 year period. Yeah. I um I want to ask a, a clarifying question, and actually one of our uh one of our viewers asked a similar question. You know, I, I was going to ask if you could explain why, um, I mean, because because what you said I think would, would strike people as as um odd in that you know defense spending has has increased obviously in nominal terms, um, but as you point out, as a share of GDP or even as a share of the overall budget, it's gone down. And so, you know, my my question was sort of you know, um, why you think that is the relevant metric look at um and you know, our, our questioner asked something something somewhat similar and says points out that the share of gdp measures the impact on the economy but in reality defense came down after iraq and the decline in afghanistan uh, and rose quickly under trump and so um you know is it you know i guess if you could give some clarity on you know what is the in your opinion the, the proper way to think about these issues and to contextualize them in the short term that's a good that's, that's, that's a great question in the short term, percent of GDP doesn't matter that much um, because in the short term, you know, the fact that the economy goes into a recession 
you don't necessarily need to adjust the fence up or down to maintain some share of GDP. The national income in the short term isn't that important. But when you're measuring over the long term, the best way to measure all spending over the long term is as a percent of national income, because that tells you what what's affordable and how much it's costing the American people to pay for military as, as a percentage of national income. And again, the percent of GDP parallel is, if you know that somebody's $100,000 know, in debt, for instance, whether that's affordable depends on whether your annual income is $100,000 or $100 million. You know, how much of your income are you paying for that? So in the short term, we, the percent of GDP isn't that important with short-term fluctuations, but I think you measure it over the long term just to get an idea. If I were to say that the defense you know, budget was $50 billion in 1940 and $700 billion right now, without any context, that doesn't tell you anything. You know, what matters is that defense was about 30% of GDP during World War II, and it's about 3% of GDP now. And so, you know, over the long term, that's just the context to put it in. In the short term, it doesn't mean that when the economy is booming, we should therefore increase defense spending, or when the economy is in a recession, we should cut it to maintain a level in the short term. It's just more of a long-term measure. So, um, so Jonathan and Brian, I wanted to, we, we have a, a question in the box that, that I wanted to ask both of you, but only, uh, only if, if you all have studied this issue, because I have not. Uh, we have a question on, the, uh, uh, on your assessments of the prospects for a new round of, of BRAC, uh, based realignment and closure in Congress. Uh, is this an issue either of you have studied before? It may be a, a question we have to table, if not. I, I, the, the last time I studied BRAC was about 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm not as up on, on where they're at right now in terms of what would be closed. And indeed, our, our questioner uh, uh, highlights that the last round of BRAC was, was, in, uh, was in 2005, about 15 years ago. So, so, so that would make mm -hmm. sense. So um, yeah, it, but it, it is an issue we'll have to look into, I think, a little bit more um, uh, because um, BRAC was obviously a, an extremely politically fraught um, process um, when, when, it was, when it was last proposed. Um, mm -hmm. It does uh, hold the, the potential for savings to taxpayers, but um, we'll, we'll have to look into that issue more. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question here um, uh, is that... Um, uh, I'm gonna run real quickly, just in, in, yeah. Go ahead, John. Brack question. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think the thing that's tough about BRAC is that uh, you know the the it's the political incentives problem, right? I mean, one of the things we saw in the last administration was that actually, you know, many officials in the Trump administration were very much in favor of of a, a new round of BRAC, and of course, it's a challenge from the standpoint of Congress. And so, um, you know, you can I think. I think sometimes people want to talk about, you know, how the last round went and, and what was good, what was bad and what should be changed. The real, as I see it, the sort of the real problem is really that incentive problem. And, um, you know, I don't don't see personally, uh, again, I haven't sort of studied it either in terms of, you know, looking at individual districts or individual bases. But I think that um, it, 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 to some degree, to the degree that back in 2005 was effective at accomplishing that goal, it's uh, it's going to be a very hard sell in the current climate to, to uh, members of Congress is kind of my take. I think it's a good assessment and, and, and makes sense. Um, uh, Brian, we received a question, and this may be for, for some of our listeners on, on the more um, uh, politically conservative side of the spectrum. Uh, th this might be valuable information to talk about and share. Uh, someone asks, um, if uh, someone asks how uh, defense spending as a share of um, as a share of GDP compares to non-defense discretionary spending as a share of GDP, do you have any insight off the top of your head as to how that has grown? Non-defense discretionary spending. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can. I I have a chart right in front of me. Non-defense discretionary spending um, has fluctuated much less. Uh, it was three point three percent of GDP in the sixties. It peaked at 5% of GDP in 1980. And since then, it has stayed basically between 3 and 4% of GDP for the last 40 years. Uh, so at this point, defense and non-defense are both about the same. Uh, they're both about 3.2% of GDP. And again, that's a level where defense used to be much higher. I mean, in, in, and under Kennedy, it was defense was 9% of GDP, fell to 6% in the 70s, 5.7% in the 70s and 80s, it's down to 3.2 today. 
for the most part, discretionary has been in that three to four range almost that entire period. Although now non-defense is at the bottom end of that range. Um, and that's the result of the Budget Control Act. They're now, they're now both at the bottom end of that range and they're both trending downward. A big thing Democrats pushed for for the last 10 or 15 years was defense and non-defense parity. At a time when defense was, was, was about a percent of GDP higher than non-defense, they wanted the two to move in line. And that's been something that that's been really important to Democrats. And now a lot of times when they, you know, when they would increase the cap for defense, they'd increase the cap for non-defense roughly equally, or at least they'd strive to do it close to equally in order to maintain this kind of bipartisan consensus that we now have. The two parties are basically linking them together in order to, to, to increase spending on both. Uh, thank you. Thank you. No, that, that's that's good sort of top level insight. And and I'm going to make uh, a plug for you, Brian. If, if you don't follow up Brian on Twitter, you absolutely should. He's at Brian <laughs> underscore Riedel. And uh, he, he uh, occasionally tweets out just great uh, chart, some of the charts that he's developed on the federal budget and the information that you share. It's really helpful for me in, in, in sort of understanding how um, you know, how different sides of the, the spending and revenue ledger in our budgets um, uh, compare. Very helpful information. Um, another question for you, Brian, um, uh, and it's a really good one. I have some thoughts on this too, but um, with, with the end of the Budget Control Act and the caps, what do you see happening to the OCO account, the Overseas Contingency Operations account uh, in, in the coming years? That's a good, it's a very good question that I don't have a great answer to. At this point, you really don't need OCO anymore. I mean, you know, OCO was was originally created because we had last minute emergencies that were totally unpredictable with Iraq and Afghanistan spending. And you had $100 billion, $150 billion. This is a separate account. It's an emergency. It's temporary. We don't want to mix it in with regular defense. Well, at this point, 20 years later, there isn't, we know what we're going to be spending on these accounts every year well ahead of time. There's really no reason to have it separate. Our presence is smaller in Iraq and Afghanistan. The costs are predictable. So at the last couple of years, the only purpose of having a separate account was to evade the Budget Control, cap, Budget Control Act caps. The OCO account didn't count for the BCA. So what happened was they would just start moving regular defense spending into OCO just to get around the BCA. But now that there is no BCA, there is no cap, you don't need to evade anything anymore. There is really no reason to have a separate account at this point. This is now part of our permanent defense posture globally. The costs are small, they're predictable, and there's no, there's no gimmicky, we have to get around the statutory caps. So it would make sense for Congress to just get rid of the OCO distinction completely and put it all in the defense appropriations. I haven't really gotten a sense of if they're going to do that, but it would probably make sense. Um, I, I it, it's a great that's a great answer. I, I I have some thoughts on this. I don't share your rosy outlook, uh, or I shouldn't uh, necessarily call it rosy, but I, I don't uh, share your uh, outlook that it's it's necessarily going to go away easily. Um, it, you're you're correct in that the release valve. I, I think I agree with you completely in that the release valve doesn't exist anymore. Uh, or the release valve, the sort of pressure for a release valve doesn't exist anymore with the end of the BCA caps. Mm -hmm. um, I am worried um, in how DOD has budgeted and planned for sort of an OCO placeholder, uh, that there could still be some games played with this count. You're, you're absolutely right that the costs are more predictable and they're going down as we reduce sort of some of our overseas operations. I still think there's important work to be done in terms of ensuring that some of the abuses we saw in the last few years with the OCO count, or at least what we saw as abuses, putting base and enduring costs into an account that was truly meant for emergency contingency needs, we probably need to do something about that. Um, and um, and uh, with that, I'll turn it for, to, to any of your thoughts, Jonathan, and if you had additional questions. Yeah, OCO for base is maybe one of my, my favorite phrases of the last five years, which uh, you know, I think it's interesting whenever you talk to, to the budget geeks, right? It's sort of, uh, you know, they present exactly what Brian, what Brian just said. And then when you talk to sort of the, the people who are more interested in the, in the military strategy, it's sort of OCO is this indispensable thing. And so there's sort of the, what it, you know, what it actually is said. And then I think there's, you know, what, what the reality is. Um, I think, I mean, I think it largely comes down to the incentives for that, that have driven 
go are have gone away with the BCA going away. And so, mm-hmm. of, of course, as we know, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to end that government program. As as you know, the the famous Reagan line points out, it's very hard to end a you know it was what was meant as a, a temporary program. But uh, I think that there are a lot of groups, um, you know, Andrew and into you, uh, top of that list, probably doing some really great work on on this stuff. So, um, yeah, I think. Um, I want to take the conversation into a little bit back to something we were talking about earlier, uh, which is just kind of what we can expect more um, in, in sort of the next two years. And I, you know, we're, we're talking about the Biden budget. We, we know that it's obviously behind or past the February 1st deadline. Uh, but I wonder if um, you could maybe just, you know, talk a little bit about what you think might might be in there, how that might differ from before. And I guess with a, with a special eye, obviously, toward the uh, toward the you know the Pentagon budget. Well, I mean, broadly speaking, uh, President Biden campaigned on $11 trillion in new spending over the decade, as well as $3.5 trillion in new taxes. That's on top of a $12 trillion baseline deficit. So if Biden got his way, uh, the net $7.5 trillion cost of his agenda would be added to the $12 trillion baseline and give us $19.5 trillion in new deficits over, just over the next decade. Um, I would expect a lot of this proposed spending to be in the budget, but the, the, what I'm hearing from White House economists is that they're probably going to wait on the taxes, the $3.5 trillion in taxes, until the economy is strong enough to handle it, which seems common sense. Uh, I don't really like $3.5 trillion in taxes to begin with. I really don't like it during a recession. <clears throat> One thing I just want to say is how radical this is. Um, Biden, Biden ran on $11 trillion in spending. The past three Democratic nominees, Kerry, Obama, and Clinton, all ran on $1 or $2 trillion in spending over 10 years that would be totally paid for. Biden ran on $11 trillion, and that was considered moderate, given how far the, the Democrats have moved to the left. So the, the Biden budget is going to be pretty interesting. In terms of what to expect on defense, it's a good question. I'm not expecting a major change from the status quo. I think one of the challenges Biden fa- is going to face in his first budget is you already you're inheriting a budget process that's been going on at the agency level for 12 to 18 months, and Biden's going to present his first budget three months after taking office. They you kind of parachute into a budget process that's already the agency process. So although. Biden has never exactly been a huge, you know, defense budget cutter. He's not a progressive caucus. We're going to wipe out 20% of the defense the budget, defense budget. I do know that, you know, he hasn't exactly campaigned on increasing it very much either. But if he does want to do major structural reforms, if he does really want to significantly pare back the growth of the defense budget, I'm not sure he can do that much in three months. It's going to, he's going to need to get his people in place at OMB, get his people in place at the Pentagon and take about a year to, to, to review programs, spending trends, and really put his imprint. I would expect a lot more of an ambitious defense proposal to come in the Biden budget next year than I would this year. Oh, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I know we're, we're coming to the end of our first half hour, so maybe I'll ask one last question to you, Brian, that, uh, mm-hmm. uh, that we got that came in, which was, you know, hearkening back to our discussion from earlier about uh, uh, discretionary spending in the context of the of reconciliation and the questioner asks if they decide to move forward with a parallel bill on discretionary is there anything technically I guess that links those two other than other than the timing or are they just really just treated as as two totally separate separate bills they would be treated well they'd be treated legislatively and statutorily as two separate bills uh, it wouldn't have any any bonus I mean they, they'd be voted they'd be voted next to each other but there's and they would be promoted together but you know, I don't think they would be as linked as, say, Obamacare, where you really couldn't do one without the other. I think you would just have certain certain expenditures that are discretionary in one bill and mandatory or revenue in a different bill. Um, I, I'm waiting to see how they do this. I don't really have a good answer for how it's going to work out with, with some of the discretionary things they're trying to do on, on the sidecar, because this is not something that's been done very often. Well, great. Um, well, thank you so much, Brian, for your time. Really uh, appreciate having you. Again, that's Brian Riedel of the Manhattan Institute. I very much encourage everyone to, uh, as Andrew said earlier, to follow him on Twitter and all social networks. And uh, thanks again so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brian.
and, and, and I'll introduce our, our next guest here. Um, uh, sh uh, she, she's already joined us. Um, Mackenzie Eaglin, Eaglin is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where she works on defense strategy, defense budgets, and military readiness. She is also a regular guest lecturer at universities, a member of the Board of Advisors of the Alexander Hamilton Society, and a member of the Steering Committee of the Leadership Council for Women in National Security. Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, of course, of course. Um, well, um, let's let's talk the defense budget. Um, I, I want to talk more about a piece that you actually wrote for foreign policy. You co-wrote for foreign policy in September of last year. It's titled How to Trim the Defense Budget Without Harming U.S. Security. Uh, can you share with our listeners, and we'll share that link in the chat, uh, some context for the recommendations that you made in this piece and why you and your co-authors decided to publish this piece? Sure. Thanks for asking. I, you know, it was, it's an interesting time. You know, we, the, the trend lines for the defense budget have already, you know, they've been in place before this incoming administration where the last secretary of defense talked about losing two points of buying power per year in 2020 and 2021. And that's correct. And so, and, and on top of that, he had been launching all these internal um, efficiency drills and reviews to sort of find more, ever more money to either stop spending at all or to invest into more into executing the national defense strategy of 2018 that was issued under Jim Mattis. And so you know, the Department of Defense was already sort of operating under this assumption of flat or declining budgets and they're trying to live within those means. And me and my colleagues, um, Bridge Colby, who helped co-author the defense strategy for Mattis and Roger Zackheim, who runs the Reagan Institute um, uh, and, and other organizations, you know, we got together and we started talking saying, you know, there, conservative internationalists can agree on ways to what the title kind of says, trim defense without harming security. But our, our answers are not the politically popular ones. They're really hard to do. You know, it's like everything in defense. It's, it's in most things, I should say. It's an ecosystem. So when you pull one string because you want to get at one set of savings, you usually have to address like three other issues or things or fix uh, other problems. And so you know, ours, what we, but the, the core of it is you can still ruthlessly execute the defense strategy, but you got to do a lot of other things. And that starts with reducing mission for non -strat, um, strategic outcomes related to the strategy. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you, Mackenzie, for, for being here. And thank you for that answer. It's the, it's the analogy that I always like to use, which is the, the fat marbled in the steak. It's not just the, the piece of fat, that, you know, on the end. Um, one of the things, I, I guess we should maybe get a little bit more into the details about how you go about thinking about um, constraining the, the Pentagon budget or ha having a budget constraint in that context. Um, you know, one of the ideas that has been floated in the last year and, and, and you know, legislatively has been this idea of, you know, just that sort of a 10% across the board timing of the defense budget. And, you know, I wonder if you could talk about that effort, you know, what you make of it. And, and I guess the related question of, if not that sort of methodology, you know, how how do you think it's best to go about um, and and you know and perhaps making making cuts or at least um, you know again restraining or imposing a budget constraint in, on the Pentagon? So as I kind of wrote in the article, my big answer is, you know, when there's no guiding or overarching strategy difficult budget choices or trade-offs that are hard, they just become shots in the dark. And arbitrary figures, whether that's what the Budget Control Act should, should restrain or what the top, you know, how much by how much we should cut the top line, those are all arbitrary. So too is the defense top line itself, right? There's no baseline. It's, it's whatever the president proposes the next year, that's the baseline for defense. It's not like an entitlement, uh, you know, which is, which goes up with inflation every year, right? So that is part of the challenge. In a perfect world, you'd, you'd build the budget from the ground up, but that's not how uh, the bureaucracy churns, right? So essentially we're, you know, paying, you know, uh, the, the chiefs like to talk about how like 70% of the fighting force that we have today will have 10 years from now. And that's just kind of how it works. It's nothing really turns on a dime in an organization this large, but, you know, so I don't like anything that's arbitrary. I don't like 10% figures because they sound convenient and they're double digit. I don't, I don't like half a trillion from BCA because that just seems like the right number. If there's data and analysis and thoughtfulness behind it, you know, then, then that's a good starting point for a conversation. But regardless of kind of, you know, should we trim 
I don't like to focus on the inputs, right? The dollars. I want to focus on the outputs. What are the dollars getting you? You know, what is it buying for the country? What is it getting for the force? What does it allow us to, to have and to secure? And, and that's really, you know, for me, the big broad starting point. But then when you get into the brass tacks of things, you know, there needs to be a couple other fundamental reviews in addition to the seemingly dozens that Biden Pentagon has already undertaken. And I would say the foremost among them of importance is a rules and missions review. And there hasn't been a good one done in over, well over a decade uh, by the department. Congress tried to do it. It wasn't very useful. Uh, and if you want to start eliminating, you know, sort of redundancies and overlaps, for example, among, among the services, which then leads to potentially saving money, you have to start with that bigger question of like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What is, what's the task list behind the outcome of the the war plan or the contingency plan, and where can we, you know, accept risk? Where can we reduce ambitions? And then, you know, eventually you, that trickles into like planning uh, and programming line items and, and, and budget dollars. I think it's a great perspective, and it, it's one that I try to remember as as I'm thinking about the defense budget and non-defense parts of the budget. That um, it is it is never enough, and, and it's never really quite sufficient to say, well, yeah, just cut you know this many billion or cut this percent from the budget. I think it has to be informed by strategy. So I think that's a great point um, to sort of. Um, uh, flip to um, you know the opposite of the ten percent. 10% perspective, which is um, we've heard some defense officials and some congressional Republicans uh, sort of uh, robustly defend and advocate for a three to 5% annual growth in the defense budget as sort of necessary to, um, to, to meet certain strategic goals and objectives uh, that the military has. Uh, what do you make of, of that goal? Do you, do you also see an arbitrariness there or is there more of a strategy behind that push? Um, and and what, to, to, to your point, Mackenzie, what does three to 5% annual growth buy you in the defense budget that, that a flat budget would not? Hmm. <laughs> well, that second question is really the, the zinger. That's the, that's the greatest question, frankly. But, <laughs> uh, right, so... Um, right. So it started under Secretary Mattis and then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, uh, Joe Dunford. You know, basically, you know, Secretary Mattis issued the 2018 defense strategy, essentially calling out China as the pacing threat, saying we're in a new era of a long-term competition with both of these countries. I would say one, you know, they're obviously very different scenarios. You know, one's ascendant, one's descendant, but nonetheless, uh, different regions, different theaters, different capabilities, but still, you know long-term competition and and we're losing our traditional advantages uh, as, as our own military as they seek to counter those traditional advantages across the service domains, you know, air and sea and space and undersea, et cetera. So uh, that was sort of the, the premise and that, you know, and there was some, you know, discussion in the unclassified version, you know, that you, we sort of need more efficiency and economies of scale in our approach to the Middle East so that there can be more emphasis on the Asia Pacific region. So that's sort of the, the strategy in a nutshell. And then as it was reviewed and stress test by a congressional bipartisan independent commission, right? They agreed with that rough crude metric of three to 5%. Essentially that was the growth that Madison Dunford said was needed per year above inflation per year, probably for at least half a decade to essentially buy the national defense strategy of 2018. Um, having been a staff member to the commission who wrote that chapter, endorsing the three to five percent, I can tell you it was a big debate behind the scenes for the commissioners, as you might imagine. One of the issues wasn't necessarily the number, but the crudeness of it that I just referenced. And essentially that the department lacked really good data and analysis behind it. So, I mean, I, I guess we shouldn't really be that surprised. It wasn't as bad as finger in the wind, but it was definitely kind of back in the envelope. Um, and you know, we, the commission tried and the staff tried really hard to pull that out of all of the various, um, over hundreds really of witnesses that came forth and came away with the very bleak conclusion that the department has given away a lot of its analytical capability over the years and wargaming, which is all in the report. Anyway, long answer to give you the backstory, which I think is more fun. Uh, so I do think it is probably about right, meaning um, you know what's needed if you if you really want to sort of focus on this long-term competition. And if you did, 
uh, and so what would that number translate into? I have it somewhere not in front of me right now at the moment, but it's, you know, basically the 2023 defense budget would be $800 billion. So obviously that's not going to happen. So it's really now just where, where are we? We are where Dr. Hicks now the deputy secretary of defense is what she said in her confirmation hearing was that was what was required to buy that strategy. This team's going to have their own. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the, the, the plug for sort of our way of thinking on this stuff, I think, it, you know, it really just comes down to the strategy should drive the dollars rather than the other way around. And this is, I think that's a mistake that sides make you know, with some regularity is that people who want to see lower levels of spending, um, they sort of talk from that standpoint, and, and, and you know, then build the strategy around that lower level. Um, and, and, you know, and, and the same thing goes for people who want to see bigger, bigger budgets. And I think it's the strategy is the key. And, we um we got a question sort of along those lines, you know, saying uh, the questioner asks, um, fitting with our current great power strategy, doesn't it make sense to reduce the size of the ground force and strength and all of these other things, equipment buys and military personnel and O and M will will follow follow from that. So I don't know if you have a response to that. So I you know I do think that's the conventional wisdom, uh, but I see uh, well a couple of different things, right? So we have these three theaters, uh. uh of focus by the department where the challenges are different in each place and the services roles uh, are also different by by area by problem set by contingency by region and you know different services um what's uh, dominance or superiority or what they do best you know it matters depending on the problem right so seizing and holding terrain is still a central part of solving the Russia challenge, because if they, for example, like the, the war games conducted by Rand and, and really smart people over there, for example, that look at the, the, the scenario of, you know, uh, not the little green men scenario, but more where uh, they try to basically break up, Putin tries to break up NATO by moving into a Baltic state and then get, seizing the capital, essentially. So, you know, it's easy to assume away the army thinking like those messy ground wars are over, counter-terror is sort of uh, an, a grind that will go on forever and mostly special operations led, but really at the end of the day, what the army is good at uh, and that last sort of mile and the longevity of mission is, is not, it, it's not that it's not useful anymore, it is. And there's also a tremendous role for the army to play in, in the Pacific as well. You know, as they're acquiring new capabilities and thinking up new concepts, a couple of different thoughts. You know, I see the art, the army playing a really key supporting role in sea control going forward, which is something the army hasn't done before, or at least not recently, I should say, uh, for example. And, you know, when I think of which service basically is the face of the military when it comes to our allies and friends and partners around the world, you know, sort of the, the shoe leather handshake, where do we have long and deep relationships? I know the Navy is the most forward force, but really uh, the Army is like our allied forward force also, meaning, you know, we have so many different programs, security forces assistance, the National Guard state to state program, uh, on and on and on. You know, it's really, if, if you're going to rely more on your friends and allies, you, you, you need those deep relationships that the Army has built along with the Navy. You can't, as I think it was David Petraeus said, you can't surge trust when you need it in the, in the crisis. So I actually see a lot of you know usefulness for the army in, in going forward particularly with the tricky Russia uh, problem set but people are the single most expensive asset on the balance sheet of the department there's no doubt about you know that's the most expensive weapon systems or people and that's what it costs to have professionals uh, that are volunteering to do this when they could do something else it's what it costs to have them trained and ready so Yes, I mean, there's no, but so it's a long answer of saying, but sure, you got to look at the cost of people, particularly active duty, uh, when you think about uh, meeting a flat top line. For sure. And, and um, you know, uh, notwithstanding the sort of uh, the element we've been discussing here, which is that, you know, it, it's, it's that the strategy should inform the top line rather than the other way around. Um, obviously, a lot of folks, I think, in our community are eagerly awaiting and wondering what the first Biden budget is going to look like. Now, we heard, uh, or some of our listeners may not have heard that 
um, uh, Press Secretary Jen Psaki yesterday confirmed that um, that the Biden budget is going to be delayed now delayed relative to the statutory deadline that was expected. Uh, I think it already has passed the, the statutory deadline for Biden to submit a budget to to Congress. We don't expect that until, you know, mid late March at the earliest. But Mackenzie, I, I, I don't know if you're you're hearing anything internally or if you just I, I would be curious to get your perspective on what you think is going to come out of the Biden defense budget. I mean, we just saw mm -hmm. yesterday that he is sort of announcing this DOD led review of America's posture towards towards China. W what do you expect from the first Biden DOD budget? Yeah, I would expect it even later than you said. I, I'm looking, I would target mid April to, to early May. And um, right. So if you go back in the last three administrations in the first year of the first term, right, it's been April May and May, I believe, uh, for the first budget to come out. And I, you know, we probably, as is standard also, there won't be a five-year defense budget plan with it. It doesn't mean we can't get that framework document, though, in March. I, I would love to get that, sort of just the couple-page overview by department and priority and, and maybe even a top line. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, you know, I've been tracking the confirmation hearings very closely for the secretary and the deputy secretary. I also, of course, tracked all of the comments yesterday at the Pentagon by our national leaders, um, the president and the vice president, and you know they are advertising what's coming, and so and and they continue to do that. So I think we can take them at their word, right? Uh, it's clear that the, the Secretary Austin has reaffirmed the pacing threat, as the department calls it, is China. I, I do believe they'll clarify their views and differentiate them from the last administration, saying potentially that Russia is the more immediate challenge. However, right, China is the long-term pacing threat, but near term, there are some things that need to be different than I think the last team was thinking regarding Russia. So we know the challenges, but what are the priorities? Okay, because you have to deal with the threats as they are, not as we wish them to be. But then there's this this team's priority set and the president and others keep telling us over and over what those three priorities are and there shouldn't be any confusion. Uh, the first one is the pandemic, the second is climate change, and the third is diversity. Uh, as well as eliminating extremism and sexual assault. So those are the priorities for the Defense Department and dollars will follow those priorities to some extent. Uh, in other ways, it'll be different kinds of posture or basing, uh, you know, those kinds of, um, uh, those types of changes. But in other cases, there will be dollars that follow it, but particularly, uh, for example, I believe on climate change. Let me, um... Let me ask you something, Mackenzie. The um, you know, as we're as we're talking here, the CBO actually just came out with their latest uh, baseline, and there's a there's a line in there in the new report uh, where they say, "quote If current laws governing taxes and spending generally remain unchanged, CBO projects in 2021 the federal budget deficit will total 2.3 trillion dollars, and federal debt will reach 102 percent of GDP, uh, with real real GDP growing by 3.7 percent." I wonder, um, you know. Thinking about trade-offs, I mean, you know, this is kind of the political reality that you know the Biden team will have to be thinking about. And while you know, certainly at least from the rhetoric standpoint, there's perhaps you know, less of a, a deficit hawk component on uh, you know among the Democrats than there are among Republicans. Um, I wonder to what degree you think that this broader context uh, will impact. The, the defense budget specifically, you know, do you think that, and and it may just be that it's it, you know it's a it's a political cudgel that's used to to, to justify pre-existing beliefs about the optimal level of the Pentagon budget, but um but but I, I do wonder you know your thoughts on on you know, what impact if any this this broader picture you know it, obviously the the federal budget picture was not great going into the pandemic and it has changed quite radically, uh, you know as we begin to come out of it, and so you know what what effect if any do you think that will have on 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 budgets uh, maybe this upcoming budget, but also, you know, going forward in the next few years. Sure. And if, uh, as we all know, that's just the debt that we measure, <laughs> right? So it's actually uh, far larger than that if, if, if we include other forms of uh, uh, federal deficit and debt spending. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. So I, I think it puts, you know, the parallels to 2011 are not perfect. Uh, the, the, these are totally different times, meaning the rise of the Tea Party, the shellacking that President Obama took in the midterms after, you know, party line vote on Obamacare and that sort of thing. But like, but the the rapid accumulation of a lot of debt in a short amount of time coming out of 2008 financial crisis, right? Um, and the, 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 the economics, the high debt, low growth period, I'd argue that followed uh, based on policies of both administrations, the Bush and Obama ones. So, uh, you know, except 
that now it's even more shocking and eye popping the level of debt. So, right. What's the state of this on the Hill? Well, having worked there myself, I could just say in my own opinion, they're both big government parties. They're one's just slightly less big government than the other, or when the other one has, you know, uh, the control and then you don't, right? So I remember when I was testifying before Senator McCain and the committee um, and it was, um, you know, right after the strategy came out and um, every Democrat on the committee asked me uh, basically like how we could afford Trump's tax cuts, right? And this was the Armed Services Committee. And so, right, they were, they were deficit minded at the time, just like Republicans were likely to be now as well. Um, partly for real reasons, obviously, and partly because of political posturing. You know, moving uh, such a large stimulus bill, not that it's not needed. I think stimulus is, continued stimulus is absolutely needed in, in what's this the, going on a year now dealing with this pandemic. But moving it so quickly out of the gate on a party line vote, what I worry about is, well, obviously the, the size of that and how that's going to then impact what else they can do, um, you know, kind of poisoning the well, not even a fig leaf of pretending to work together, uh, but really the absence of, and, and then on top of the absence of a budget control act, top line, you know, figures for discretionary spending uh, and kind of like the stability that brought to, to br allow for regular order for appropriations bills to move on time. I'm, I'm just as worried about, you know, and then of course a debt ceiling increase again, confronting Washington later this year. It, that doesn't bode well for starting the year either. Not on, you know, it, it, it just doesn't look good for good governance. Um, and it it's increases the likelihood of another government shutdown potentially or a spending freeze, right? A continuing resolution. See, our, uh, continuing resolutions do you such unique damage to the Department of Defense. I, it can't be overstated. In fact, the commission, uh, the National Commission on Military Aviation Safety, which just issued its report a couple of weeks weeks ago, uh, excuse me, a couple months ago, foot stomped this point over and over. They were like, it's not about how much you give them; it's about when they get their money. Uh, and I can go on and on about the readiness impacts um, of the department, but basically like the summit, and this is just sort of a microcosm example of why does it hurt DOD so much to have um, a spending freeze. So, so the commissioners, they said like flying is like surgery and other like highly technical professions. It's a perishable skill. So you have to like routinely practice it to keep your proficiency. And they talked about you know, when a unit's funding comes like later in the fiscal year, you can't make up lost training time and you can't make up the deferred maintenance that was foregone for that period of time as well. So they said no funding can reverse the impact of insufficient flying hours, missing parts and deferred maintenance timing is everything. And that's an understatement. So, you know, I, that's, a, I'm not really worried about what's the de defense top line. I'm worried about when they're gonna get their dollars, frankly, for 2022. That's fair. Um, and I actually want to sort of um, zoom in uh, by, by asking a question that, that we received in, in our Q&A box, uh, Mackenzie. It's, it's an interesting concept here. And it's sort of, you know, to, to, to use your terminology, it's, it's potentially a microcosm of what we're talking about here. Uh, the question goes, former Defense Comptroller Elaine McCuster put forth the proposition that things like defense health care should be considered mandatory spending and that we begin the process of separating in defense that which is truly discretionary versus that which more closely tracks to what's considered mandatory for the rest of America. What are your thoughts on this concept, if any? Yes, um, I'm, we're really happy that she's joined our team at AEI, uh, along with John Ferrari, uh, former G8 of the Army. So basically, they're being counter and budget guy, uh, and, and a couple other new team members. So I'm glad to see that you guys uh, you're, have all kind of taken note of their report just out uh, two days ago. So yeah, it's a it's it's a, um, and it's definitely her her big issue, which is get the non-core defense. Um, work the business and the money out of the defense budget so that it more accurately reflects what's required for security. I, you know, there's, I think there, she has a case to be made. She's a former acting comptroller as of like not too long ago, right? So, you know, helps sort of figure out where that 700 plus billion dollars go every year. And what she's really getting at is saying like, what? It, so what are the non-core functions of the defense department, right? So Arnold Pinaro talks about this a lot, right? Like we're like a DOD is like a healthcare meets FedEx meets Aetna meets like, you name it, like, you know, um, Arizona State University that occasionally like kills a terrorist. Obviously he's being a little silly, but 
the department, you know, they do run grocery chains. They do run a global school system, for example. They do run their own healthcare operation. Those kinds of things, are they required to man, train, and equip the force? Maybe, maybe not. Some are, some aren't. Some are, some are just their benefits that are nice to offer to, again, this volunteer force that can be doing other things. Um, so that's all worth debating, but they're not core war fighting responsibilities. And that's her issue. You know, like, what do you, the, what is the, you know, what are the act, you know, what is the, those in uniform, what do they need to better process, you know, deter the nation's wars. And then if we don't deter, if we, if we, if we don't uh, prevail, then, then you fight and you win. And, you know, school systems are sort of linked to that tangentially because fighting service members have families, but at the same time, you know, other agencies in the federal government, these are their core competencies. So, you know, should like, you know, can the department's vaccine research development go to NIH? Can its school system be absorbed under the Department of Education? Can its healthcare, uh, you know, can they go either separate um, to another agency or like go, can you switch the service members to like an FEHB kind of program? These are all really valid questions. I'm glad she's raising them. Uh, and what you would quickly see is like the defense budget at that point is, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars, not three quarters of a trillion dollars. Um, yeah, I think these, these are, um, I like these outside the box uh, ideas in terms of, you know, how to how to uh, structure things in a way that makes more sense. And I know we're getting toward the end of our time, so I'll maybe ask you one last question about um, another idea that, that um, has been out there, which is, um, you know, we have this problem generally as the budget process is broken down where we increasingly see, you know, omnibus legislation and sort of these, these big, you know, vote up or vote down on these massive packages that cover a lot of things. Um, and you, know, you could make the argument that the same thing exists in the defense context, where we basically authorize and appropriate all this spending as part of one big package. And so you know, I wonder if you would be supportive or what your thoughts are generally of the idea of, you know, picking up the NDAA or taking multiple votes, um, you know, with respect to um, defense authorizations and appropriations. And, um, and if so, you know, how, how you might go about doing that. Yes, it's a great point. I would, frankly, you know, it's it's almost pie in the sky, right? Tilting at windmills to think of any committee giving up power. But really, you know, as I track each year, you know, the first NDAA was one page, and now with the bill and report, we are at the multi-thousand pages. It's it's a, it's shocking, frankly. I mean, I get the size of the budget warrants kind of a lot of oversight. Absolutely, I am firmly in that camp. At the same time, you know, staffers aren't program managers or PEOs of, you know, major weapon systems, but yet it feels like that when you read the bill. Um, and what's really interesting is the longer the bills get and the more data the Defense Department provides to Congress, the unhappier everyone's getting, right? Both sides are constantly unhappy. You just read the report language with each other. Uh, you know, not enough transparency, not enough justification. Where are the better budget documents, data visualization, all these sort of Quest from the Hill, and of course, the department's pulling their hat, saying we we can fill the room with the reporting we give you. So it shows you something's really wrong, right, in this process. Uh, and maybe the best way to do it is to break it out into bite size, right? So we do, you know, Congress does appropriate military construction separately. Certain parts of, of course, the nuclear weapons program and enterprise per personnel and laboratories are also separately uh, or jointly with other committees. Yes, so you that would actually be one way to get at this challenge, which is like, you know, you could break out by workforce, DOD civilians, act, you know, the uniformed military, you could break it out by capability, by domain, by service, but it's certainly one of those uh, wild ideas that we know the status quo isn't making anyone happy. So maybe we, we could try something different. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh... You know, I think uh, as as you go on, what do they say? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And so I think, uh, and, and hoping to get different results. So I, I think uh, these kinds of ideas, while they may not necessarily seem uh, seem feasible at the at the moment, they, I think it's important to lay the groundwork for them uh, going forward. So um, thank you for that. And um, I guess that we're toward the end of our time, so we probably should close it up there. But um, you know, Mackenzie, I'd like to really thank you for for taking your time. I think it's been very very insightful, and appreciate your candor. And um, Andrew and I are both. Very happy to see you and, uh, and and look forward to having you back on sometime in the future. Thanks. It was my pleasure. I, I really enjoyed it. And you have a great group of listeners. So I, I hope that you'll invite me again. Of course. Uh, and, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for attending uh, this uh, this latest webinar of, of on Purse Strings. And uh, 
we'll obviously get our invites to to next month and uh, look forward to uh, to talking with you all then and uh, and hearing some hopefully uh, insightful questions for our guests then. Thanks so much.